Hello everyone, I'm Joel Chasnoff and welcome back to another jam-packed episode of FIDF Live. So, as the conventional wisdom says, Israel is no bigger than the state of New Jersey. However, its scientific and technological prowess and constant drive towards innovation continue to make an impact worldwide. Israel stands proudly among the world's leaders in research and development, science and medicine, and, of course, technology. It also remains one of the top innovators in the world. Well, as it turns out, a lot of the startup in this startup nation starts right here in the IDF. As the enemy gets more sophisticated, the IDF has a never-ending need to create new methods of defense and detection, as well as treatment and healing. And this has led to tremendous advancements. These advancements protect the soldiers, save their lives and those of Israel's citizens, and reach way beyond into the world at large, including to each and every one of you. Today, we're going to look at the impact of this innovation. We'll also see examples of some of this technology in action. And what better way to kick off this episode than with a look at some of the IDF's most significant advancements. Off we go. was amazing. Well, last year, the IDF launched a new division. It's called the Innovation and Combat Methods Division. This division in the IDF's general staff has recruited some of the best minds in the IDF. Their goal? To develop new ways to maintain Israel's qualitative edge in combat. They use advanced technology to develop solutions for current threats to Israel's security, posed by Iran and its proxy terror groups. Hamas and Hezbollah. Now, personally, I am fascinated by this topic, and I admit it's a lot to wrap my head around. But lucky for me, and for you, our next guest will help us to unpack it. Joining me are two very special guests, Lieutenant Colonel Michal, who is the head of the innovation branch in the IDF's Innovation and Combat Methods Division. And joining us via Zoom is Major Amos, who is the project manager for the IDF's Digital Ground Army in a project called the Torch, or in Hebrew, Mesua. So first, let me start by congratulating both of you and the entire brigade for receiving the very prestigious Excellence Award from the Chief of Staff for Innovation. Mazal Tov. Thank you. Michal, I want to start with you. Tell me, why is combat innovation so important? I think that combat innovation is super important because we are in an arms race. Our enemies are always developing new techniques, new methods, innovating new methodologies, and we have to win. We must win. So we have to innovate. And how do you encourage soldiers to come up with new ideas and think outside the box? Well, lucky for us, as you said, in the past year, we have a new division, but also we have 
about 20 uh, innovation leaders in all of the cores and arms of, in the IDF. We have it in the Home Front Command, in the Ground Forces, in the Air Force. They are the ones that meet the soldiers, that encourage them, those brilliant minds uh, to dream, to think outside the, the box. And we at the uh, Innovation Combat Methods Division, we also go to the field, talk to the commanders, uh, help them realize their dreams. So that's the way we meet them. I love that, that you're really pulling from everyone. Yeah. So you're getting the best of the best and you're not just restricting to one group. Uh, yeah. I think that leads to the best, uh, the best solutions. Yeah. Uh, I'm told that you're leading something called an innovation community. So what does that even mean, innovation community, and how does it work? Well, actually, it's a WhatsApp group. Wow. It consists of uh, high rank commanders such as generals and also from compulsory service uh, soldiers. Uh, all of them are infected with the innovation bug. All of them have dreams and hopes and uh, projects they want to realize. And it's actually a platform they can talk with one another and help one another realize their dreams. So I think it's a way to bring, uh, uh, break silos and uh, differences between the organizations. Can I just, do I understand this correctly, that there's a WhatsApp group that generals yeah. and regular soldiers are able to share ideas back and forth? Yeah, well, they don't necessarily mention who they are. Right. I mean, ultimately, the value is how it can reach the soldiers on the ground in combat, doing the fighting, the protecting. So how do these ideas reach the soldiers out in the field? Well, two main uh, ways. One, as I said, we have the innovation leaders at all, of their, at all of the IDF. And another way, we launched a project called Innovation to the Edge. We go to the field, we meet the commanders, we talk to them, and we help them with mentorship, with providing them knowledge and uh, methodologies about innovation. There are methodologies you need to know how to do it. So mm -hmm. that's the way we help them. Do you have an attitude toward mistakes? Like, what's the policy? Because I'm sure there's a lot of mistakes made along the way. Yeah, we at the innovation fields always say that we celebrate our mistakes. That's the way we learn. That's the way we get better. And I always say that innovation is like climbing a mountain. People will try, will try to discourage you. Uh, you need to never give up. Know your direction and just go for it. Lieutenant Colonel Michal, thank you so much for joining us. We're now going to turn to one of your colleagues, Major Amos. Shalom. Hi, happy to be with you. Thank you, Major Amos. Welcome. You come from a combat background in the Nahal Brigade. Now you're an engineer. So can you tell us a little bit about the project that you're working on that's called Torch? Yeah, so for start off, for start off I would like to say that I'm a big fan of uh, Michal and all the work that she does in the innovation uh, uh, department and part of her innovation uh, community. I really think uh, she does uh, amazing things. Uh, about my project, uh, when we look at uh, innovation, you know, it's very important not to just leave it as a buzzword and uh, and and bring it uh, and and bring it to the field. And I think this is uh, the project that I'm uh, leading. Uh, this is what uh, we're doing. So the project is called uh, Torch. Uh, we're basically talking about bringing uh, combat computer, tactical computers, uh, to the field. Uh, we're talking about systems, devices. Uh, from the young uh, platoon commander, uh, looks like a little smartphone in his hand uh, in the field. Uh, the same uh, tactical computers are on tanks, artillery, in the headquarters, and uh, basically connecting all the ground forces to one digital uh, platform that is also conne uh, connected with digital radio. Uh, and also, uh, our big challenge is conducting joint uh, operations, man uh, major maneuvering uh, operations, and how do you connect the ground forces to the Air Force, to the Navy, to the intelligence? Uh, this is basically what I, our project uh, aims to do, and uh, it's already uh, in the units, in the field, uh, every day. I mean, it sounds absolutely amazing. I want to ask, how do you see this technology changing warfare as we move forward? The best way to answer the question is to understand what's happening in our civilian lives. So we have a smartphone uh, uh, that access uh, uh, a big amount of uh, data and uh, we can uh, uh, access information in seconds and also send information out into groups, uh, what have you, in seconds. So, and this is basically what's happening. We're bringing a device to the field, to the platoon commander, uh, that he can actually access all the 
uh, amazing abilities that we have in our headquarters. We're talking about fire support. We're talking about uh, giving commanders uh, a good understanding on the situation, where are our forces, where is the presumed uh, enemy, uh, 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 where are his posts, and all this in, his, in, in this device. So it's connecting everyone to each other. And, uh, and this is a real uh, revolution. It's a real revolution because things uh, move uh, rapidly, not only in the ground forces and all the different uh, forces in the IDF, uh, they're all uh, growing in this uh, digital uh, abilities. And uh, I'll like to give an example. When I was a young uh, company commander, we'd basically uh, use a radio, okay? So who, who would ever you would catch on the radio, if you would answer, if you wouldn't answer, uh, and that's uh, how you would uh, access uh, other uh, units or other uh, fire support units. And now you can do it digitally and, uh, and use these uh, abilities uh, in a very efficient, an effective way. Revolution really is the right word for what this is all about. I want to ask, what is the operational impact of all of this technology and this new system on the officers and the commanders who are actually out in the field? Well, the big, uh, the operational edge uh, for the commanders in the field is first of all, uh, understanding uh, where their forces are okay this sounds simple but it's critical uh, sadly not only in the IDF but other armies in every uh, uh, military operational uh, war we have casualties that we shoot uh, one another uh, so this is one point the second point is really uh, uh, getting quality intelligence uh, to the, the, the device of the commander and we're talking about incredible abilities in our uh, intelligence uh, uh, departments uh, in the in the army uh, that uh, can basically deal with big 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 uh, uh, big 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 data uh, of the enemy and how they uh, using technology and uh, algorithms bring the precise intelligent post of the uh, enemy uh, to the commander so once getting quality intelligence you can now make a quality uh, target that can be uh, attacked by different uh, uh, units and of course in the idf you know we're always dif uh, dealing with difficult uh, uh, warfare uh, uh, scenarios that contain also uh, uh, highly dense uh, uh, civilian areas and we always want to make sure that we're not harming civilians uh, that are not involved and uh, our mission of being precise and using uh, 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 our power intelligent uh, uh, way, it's uh, critical. Yeah, it's not just an intelligent way, but another word that comes to mind is ethical and really taking that step to make sure that we are fighting the correct enemy at the right time. And you use the word precise. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how these systems actually make fighting more accurate? Absolutely. So first of all, it's, it's important to understand part of this revolution is also using drones and all kind of different uh, uh, ro robotic uh, abilities. Uh, we always take it as a major, uh, we take it as a major understanding that we need to uh, create quality uh, targets that are based on quality intelligence. And, uh, and we're talking about visual, we're talking about uh, uh, signal intelligence and how we uh, combine these different abilities to, to create a, a quality target. And this is what uh, and this is uh, one of the major things that we take into consideration. Now, you brought up so many very big ideas that are exciting, but I want to make it personal and put a face on it. Can you share with us a story where lives were actually saved thanks to this kind of technology that you're talking about? Yeah. So one of the devices and it's important to understand, you know, developing uh, computer systems for the tactical edge is making them open, open uh, devices that can also connect to different devices into our computer systems. So one of the devices that we're using is actually monitoring uh, uh, the medical situation of an injured soldier from the minute that wow. he's uh, unfortunately uh, uh, got hit by uh, the enemy. Now, understanding, I'm talking about the, the doctors and the medical uh, system that uh, the medical process that leads the uh, uh, the injured soldier into the uh, 
a, a hospital in, in the end. So using these devices, uh, we have been able to save lives uh, for soldiers uh, that unfortunately get uh, wounded and understanding their status quickly and uh, understanding their, their status actually means uh, uh, getting ready for, for taking this injured soldier, to, uh, injured soldier uh, out of the field uh, in real time. It's a, major, it's a major step. And these are one of the devices that we are enable uh, uh, to connect to Torch. Major Amos, thank you so much for making some time for us. And thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel Michal, for joining us. This has been fascinating and eye-opening. You know, as the Chief of Staff said at the Chief of Staff Ceremony for Innovation, creativity requires leadership, innovations require leadership. Innovation requires courage, and together with innovation and leadership, you can recruit people to your ideas. Good luck, and thank you both for making a difference. This past week, I got a real treat, the chance to experience one of the best base visits yet to the Skyrider unit. And the name alone kind of says it all. The Skyrider unit is a special unit within the Artillery Corps. They operate what's known as Skylark Unmanned Aerial Vehicles, or UAVs for short. The soldiers in this unit carry the UAVs on their backs and then assemble them in the field to collect and provide real-time intelligence to the IDF. With this technology, the soldiers are able to save lives, time, and effort, all while getting the most accurate intelligence to the fighters on the ground. The Skyrider unit is part of the 215th Brigade of the Artillery Corps, which is currently adopted by FIDF through our Adopt a Unit program. Now, while we were filming, an actual alert went off. The threats are real, and the soldiers are always ready to jump into action. So now, let's get to know the soldiers of the amazing Skyrider unit. Here we are in southern Israel. We are very, very close to the border with Gaza, less than a kilometer away. Those of you who've been watching the news, you know that this has been a really hot area in the last week. It started on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Independence Day, when a rocket was fired from Gaza into Israel. Since then, Israel has used Iron Dome and taken a few other actions to respond, and more rockets have been fired. But the point is that today we're meeting with some of the soldiers who are literally on call 24-7, especially when this kind of a thing happens. This is their area of the country to protect, and they're on call and ready. So let's go ahead uh, and meet some of the soldiers. The first one we're going to talk to is an officer with the Skyrider unit. This is Sagi. Nice to hey. meet you. Yeah, and you know we're all vaccinated, so we can shake hands now, which yeah. is awesome. <laughs> Sagi, first of all, thank you for all you've been doing this past week. It's been a very... It's uh, my pleasure. Tell us about this week. What's it been like for you, your unit? As you said, the situation here is uh, quite hot. But I think uh, we have a big impact on the picture um, here in the border. It feels very satisfying. So, Skyrider, tell me about the unit, what exactly you guys do, and uh, what makes you different from other units uh, in the IDF? Our job is to... Uh, take the Skylark, uh, which is our uh, plane, and uh, fly it all around the borders of Israel. Specifically, my team is here in the Gaza border, and our job is to gather visual intelligence and help protect the border. So when your plane goes up, it's not firing anything, there's no weaponry, it's just bringing back photos, uh, film. And because of its height and silence, um, the enemies don't know when it's above them and that's what makes it useful. So we're, uh, we're on the base visiting with the soldiers when we just got a call. Apparently something is going on over the border in Gaza. Right now we're located in what's called the Gvul uh, Meshulash, the triangle border, where Egypt, uh, Gaza, and Israel all share a border. And uh, that's the area that we're going to right now with the soldiers from their, this unit. Their entire job is when this kind of a thing happens, to send up a reconnaissance airplane, gather the uh, information, the intelligence with cameras, 
send that back to the ground where uh, commanders and officers will decide what action to take next, if any. So now uh, the mission has been completed. Uh, we're just cleaning up the loose ends here, guys. Wonderful job. That's the first time I ever got to see that kind of a thing in my life. All right, I'm now out in the Shetach, out in the field with the women combat soldiers who are part of the Sky Rider unit. We're going to meet a lone soldier right now and get a little more information about just what they're up to. I want to uh, emphasize that this unit is on what's called in Hebrew Konanut. They're on high level of readiness, and at any moment these days, they're getting called into action for missions. Come. Elisa. Ken. Hey. Hi, how are you? So, Elisa is from Philadelphia. We're lucky enough to have a lone soldier with us. Thanks for letting us join up with your of unit course. today. Come on over. Welcome. Can you tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing right now? What this contraption is and so we work what's with happening? drones. This is what's called the mash okay. drone. It launches the plane. This is what we use. It's a, used with a bungee, so it'll launch the plane forward. Right here behind us, they're working with a, they're working on building the plane and running it through tests before we launch it. And Gal is working now to set up the mash drone to make sure that it's all ready for the plane. How long does it take you from the time you get the call to the time you're ready to, to send it? We're away? in the air under 15 minutes. Wow. So right now, your teammates over here in the truck, it looks yeah. like they're assembling the plane. What exactly are they doing? Yeah, so they're working with the plane right now. And I think that it looks like they're switching the um, battery to make sure that we can be up there for as long as possible. Do you ever have moments where you're during an operation and you think to yourself, what I'm doing right now is actually saving somebody else, especially here, we're so close to the Gaza border and things are heated right now. Uh, does that kind of go through your mind? Yeah, so actually I live on Kibbutz Erez, which is a small kibbutz right on the border of Gaza. It's That's about, nearby. Yeah, about 15 minute drive from here. Really lucked out with the location of my base. Um, and there was an event that I, I'm in the air and I see my kibbutz and that's really meaningful because my wow. friends are there and I'm on base, but I, I'm still there with them. I'm, I'm looking out for them and that's really, really meaningful. Elisa, thanks so much for the time. Of course. It was really great to it spend some time with your unit and you and get to know you better. Thank you, it was nice speaking with you. Stay safe. Thank you. Okay. What an amazing day. We got to meet a field of women combat soldiers launching their intelligence gathering plane. We were called on a real-time operation and got to hang out with some of the guys doing reconnaissance over Aza. And we got to meet you, Sagi, Mamash, Todarabad. Thank you so much for giving thank us you, time and you. insight. It was a real pleasure. My pleasure, too. As one of the most technologically sophisticated armies in the world, with the top intelligence and cyber units, the IDF is now using innovative approaches to build their talent funnel. The Makshimim program is a phenomenal example of just this. Makshimim was created to help the IDF continue to meet its technological needs while also providing transformative opportunities for teens growing up in Israel's lower socioeconomic areas, what's known in Israel as the periphery. Many high school students in the periphery do not have similar educational and growth opportunities as their peers in the center of the country. So Hamag Shimim equips these students with the knowledge and skills they need to serve in key positions in the IDF's most sought after units, units that include cyber, technology, and intelligence. Serving in these units can actually become a launching pad to the rest of their lives. Well, here to speak to us a little bit more about the program is Colonel Shai. He is the head of the advisory board of Magshimim and Morty, a graduate of the program who went on to serve in Modi'in intelligence. Colonel Shai, Morty, thank you so much for joining us on FIDF Live. This is a fascinating topic. Colonel Shai, I want to start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about Magshimim, why it's important, 
and how it relates to IDI, Israel Defense Intelligence. Well, uh, Makshimim is a national excellence program. Uh, it was founded a decade ago uh, by a group of commanders from the IDI, uh, and uh, it was associated uh, with association uh, with the education center. Uh, and the program was founded in order uh, to face the increasing demand uh, for knowledge in security service candidates eligible for a cyber uh, position in the IDF. And uh, the program uh, provides skills uh, in programming and uh, cyber uh, knowledge and uh, tools uh, and more of it, uh, it provides values of how to study and how to wow. face challenges in the, in, the, in the technological area. But I think it's mostly in our uh, challenges in the IDI. So uh, that was the first topic. But later on, I think uh, two years uh, afterwards, uh, it was pointed in the, for students in the periphery. And uh, it was aimed to give them uh, equal uh, opportunity uh, to integrate in the IDI and uh, in the cyber industry. And these are kids who might not have the chance otherwise, actually probably wouldn't have the chance because they're growing up in certain areas of the country. I think that the program, it aimed for very uh, excellent uh, students, but studying and uh, growing up in the periphery, uh, the aim of the program is, is to help them to fulfill their potential. It's not about their, all of them are excellence, but Makshimim is giving them the opportunity uh, to take their potential and to, uh, to take and to bring it on uh, into the army and uh, to help them to integrate in the best units in uh, the IDI and afterwards in the cyber industry after service. And I hear that there's a new program now called Mamriot, which is, is exclusively for female students, mm -hmm. young women. So tell us about why the need for that and what that's all about. Well, uh, Mamriot was established uh, in order to encourage uh, more females uh, applicants uh, into the industry because, uh, as we all know, uh, its number in the, in the industry and in the IDI especially is significantly lower. So we, were, uh, we wanted to found a, a kind of program which will enable us to uh, give them a very supportive uh, program which will enable them uh, to learn and to join the cyber industry uh, very uh, easily, and Mamriot has a special uh, educating program for females, and uh, joyfully, we have established three classes, wow. and uh, we have equal uh, percentage of uh, graduates from uh, Mamriot. Uh, it's the same number of uh, That's Makshimim. So we're going to turn now to one of the male graduates. Uh, Mordi, how did you feel when you heard that you were accepted into the Magshimim program? Uh, well, um, at the beginning, I didn't know exactly what to feel because I didn't know what I'm getting into. Um, but then, as I uh, started with the program and, uh, and met d my friends uh, from, uh, from classroom and uh, did assignments and stuff like this, I understand two things. One, it will be fun, very fun. Um, some of my closest friends until this day are from uh, uh, Magshimim. And two, it, it's going to be difficult, very difficult. Uh, there were no discounts to nobody, nobody and uh, it was difficult, but fun. Morty, I want to ask you about the arc of your life overall. Do you think your life would be different if you hadn't joined the Magshamin program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the obvious thing, the obvious thing that everyone knows about Magshamin is the skills and, and knowledge it gives, but in addition, it's the opportunity that matters. Um, where I grew up, I didn't even know about the high tech or, or the industry or intelligence at the army. Yeah, I, I didn't know any about, anything about it. Um, and thanks to Magshimim, I had the opportunity to try to, to dream, to think about it, to, to be ambitious about my journey in life and, and, and do all this amazing journey and go throughout this, all, this entire amazing journey um, so far. And I know that that's what the program is all about. Yeah.
not clear. Well, one thing Colonel Shai mentioned is that it becomes a bridge, not just to the Army, but to a life in technology that goes beyond. And um, you have a startup that you've been working on for only three months, but today or this week you're this launching. Week. So first of yeah. all, Mazal Tov. Thank you very much. Can you tell us anything about GRIP? It's called GRIP, right? GRIP, yeah. So what do you um, want to tell us? Um, first of all, thank you. <laughs> uh, it is really, really exciting, you know, the launch and everything. Um, and uh, after six years of uh, service, to have the opportunity to join the heart of the cyber industry in Israel, it's an opportunity that without Makshimim I wouldn't have a chance. Um, and GRIP, about well, GRIP, you mentioned uh, the startup, uh, we're actually doing uh, SaaS security. It's uh, uh, for businesses to manage their SaaS portfolio applications in, in, in the organization, um, I, to have control over what the employees of the company um, using and where the data of the organization actually going to. Well, in a few months, when you're a billionaire, <laughs> maybe you'll take the three of us out to dinner and pick up the check. I really look forward I to getting promise. together again. I promise. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Morty and Colonel Shai. It's amazing work. Uh, the heart of the program is just so beautiful and so Jewish and Israeli. So it's a great message for all of us. And for all of you at home, we're going to be hearing more about this program in a few weeks when we hear about the students who are taking Israel by storm. You won't want to miss it. Now for one of my favorite parts of the show, the chance to meet our lone soldiers, those who leave their friends, family, and everything familiar so they can serve in the IDF. Today we're going to talk to Corporal Nathan. He's a lone soldier from Stamford, Connecticut, who is serving in the Nahal Brigade. Now, I actually happen to know Nathan from back when I lived in Westchester, New York, so this is sort of a reunion of sorts. Hey, Nathan, great to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you, too. Thanks so much for being on FIDF Live. I want to ask you, what uh, made you decide to become a lone soldier in the IDF? Uh, well, I had a lot of uh, influences throughout my life uh, that, wanted, that made me draft. My grandfather was, a, uh, he was a, an officer in the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War. Wow. Um, I had camp counselors who had served, a lot of uh, older friends who had served. Um, but I, I'd say that the, the main reason that I wanted to come over and serve uh, become a lone soldier, as you said, um, was because I believe in the state of Israel as a value. I believe that it's important to have a state of Israel. And I think that if it's something that's so important to me and so uh, influential in my life, I should be the one who, who fights to defend it. Um, it should, the fact that I was born on the other side of the world doesn't now excuse me um, from, from taking part in defending the thing that I love so much. Wow. Well said. How do you feel now that you're wearing the IDF uniform and, you know, it's the uniform you dreamed of wearing? Yeah, it, it feels uh, surreal at times. Uh, we just had Yom Atzmaud, Yom Azikaron, uh, Yom HaShoah, and, and being in uniform around these times, it's, uh, it's very different. Um, to now stand and sing Hatikva in uniform is very different than, than normal years when I had uh, tekes in school or things like that. Um, around these times, even when you're walking down the street and people say, good job, um, it's, a diff it's, an entirely different, it's an entirely different experience um, to be in uniform. It is. It's a completely different connection with the country. I know that. And now you're in commander's course. Uh, what made you decide to become a commander and, and how is that going? I know it's pretty hard. Yeah, so I just started um, the, it's called Course Mocking, the squad commander's course. So hopefully at the end of this uh, four-month course, I'll get between eight and twelve soldiers um, that will be that I'll be their commander. Um, yeah, like you said, it's pretty difficult. I'm actually coming off a Lila Lavan, a night of no sleep. We had an all-night navigation last night, so still going hard. Um, I think the reason that I wanted to become a commander is so that I can influence more people. And I think myself coming from abroad, having this outside perspective, can really help um, uh, influence more soldiers. Yeah, lone soldiers, I've noticed, they bring with them really this extra dose of motivation, and it does rub off. I think it's contagious, and when you put yourself in a leadership position, you know, that's going to help all the more. I know it's been a long year with the whole world facing a pandemic. When was the last time you saw your family? So I actually saw them about six months ago, 
uh, but before that, I got I came to Israel in uh, September 2019. I did a six month uh, pre military it's called a Mechina pre military program, and then drafted uh, in March 2020 to the Nachal Brigade. And then I did eight whole months of training, and only then I got to saw, see my family. So I flew back. So that was after a year and two months of not seeing them. I saw them for a month, and now it's been about six months since I've seen them. How was that reunion when you went back? That first time, yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. It was, on, on the one hand, it, I felt like I never left, and on the other hand, um, it felt completely different. It, feel, it was very, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. So, Nathan, uh, since you haven't seen them in a while, anything you want to say to your family that I'm sure is watching at home right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I love you guys. I miss you guys. Um, I talk to you a lot, but and I love to speak to you and hear about your lives. And it's good to hear that everything's okay, even without me there. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for joining us. And good luck with the rest of Commander's course. I know it's tough, but I know you, and you'll stick through it just fine. We wish you the thank best. Thank you so much. And also in the rest of your service. And say hi to your parents for us also, okay? Thank you so much. Bye, Lutrot. As we often say on this show, FIDF is a vital partnership between you, the supporters, the IDF, and its soldiers. Together, we protect and transform the future of Israel. We also change lives and create a brighter future for the soldiers and Israel for years to come. Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to one of FIDF's most dedicated supporters, Gary Sobel from Atlanta, Georgia. When I heard that there was an organization whose sole mission was to provide for the care and the well-being of the brave young men and women of the IDF, as well as for their families, I was all in immediately. It was my opportunity, my chance to make a difference in their lives while they look after our homeland and Jews everywhere. From events, galas, mission trips, the opportunity to see life for them on their bases, on their turf, hear their stories, I was captivated. That was 14 years ago. And I'm as passionate about supporting our soldiers today as I was then. Hero. FIDF is the only organization whose sole mission is to provide for the care and well-being of our brave soldiers. Everything we do is humanitarian in nature. Supporting our soldiers is not just the responsibility, it's also our obligation. It's part of who I am. It's something I will pass down to my, to my daughter and from generation to generation. We all share this responsibility. This is who I am. The Adopter Brigade program is unique. It's a microcosm of all of FIDF's support targeting towards a brigade. And when you adopt that brigade, there's a personal connection. For us in the Southeast, we adopted the Combat Intelligence Brigade. Whether it's financial support, spiritual needs, supporting the lone soldiers, all of this is grouped together and we know that we're making a difference in the lives of an entire brigade at one time, over 4,000 soldiers. Several years ago at the Atlanta Gala, we were profiling the lone soldiers because you see our community has at any given time approximately 40 lone soldiers serving in the IDF. These are the kids from our day schools, from our synagogues, our community. We couldn't be more proud. As we we're about to introduce a lone soldier to say hello on video from Israel, we flipped the script and we asked him to come out to say hello to his family. When Jojo came out from the back of the room, everybody's head swung back to see him. Uh, it's something I'll never forget. Uh, the look on his parents' face. 
um, it was special. And our community talks about it to this day. And that does it for our FIDF Live episode on technology and innovation. Now, if only the IDF could come over and help me set up my new Wi-Fi router, we'll be set. In any case, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. For more information on Adopt a Unit, Magshimim, Lone Soldiers, or any of FIDF's programs that you heard about tonight, you can always go to FIDF's website at FIDF.org and click on How We Help. And hit, please join our family. Sign up to follow Friends of the IDF on Facebook and Instagram, and make sure to mark your calendars for Tuesday, May 11th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern for our next episode. We're going to be celebrating Mother's Day and Yom Yerushalayim. You won't want to miss it. Invite your family, friends, and all Israel lovers, too. I'm Joel Chasnoff, and I'll see you there.